for joining us today for our webinar. If you are one of our webinar regulars and you tuned in to hear the comic stylings of Sean Gibbons, who's our normal moderator, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but Sean is on vacation this week. My name is Amy Kramer. I'm the new Managing Director at the Communications Network, and I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to be able to present this webinar today. Um, as a recovering journalist, this is actually particularly interesting to me. Um, as I'm sure it will be to, every, to, to all of you. We're joined today by Lindsey Green Barber of Impact Architects. They work with media and communications practitioners and funders across the country and around the world to design high impact communication strategies and to build frameworks to assess the effectiveness of those strategies. Drew Jacobs is the Strategy Learning and Evaluation Officer for the Walton Family Foundation. Christine Schneider is the Senior Communications Officer working at the Foundation's K-12 education efforts. And Kristen Trotz is the Program Officer with the Foundation's Environment Team working on coastal restoration in the Gulf of Mexico. The Walton team will get into the details, but to set the stage, the Foundation has recently found itself making more media-oriented investments while not identifying themselves as a traditional media funder, they're making um, a huge leap in this space. As Christine and Kristen looked across some of their investments in their, in their portfolios, they realized that they had a lot of common questions, and they reached out to colleagues to help shape a learning process to figure out how they can think about measuring the impact from investments in media work, which I know is interesting to all of us, and across all their grant making. So over the next hour, we're going to cover a whole lot in, um, in, in this topic. And just a few logistical items before we get started. We have a full house, so we'll try to take everybody's questions. Please use the chat box to send your questions in. You can also engage with us on Twitter using the hashtag ComNetLive. And as always, this webinar will be recorded and we'll post it online at comnetwork.org and you can watch it and listen to it a thousand more times. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm going to hand it over to Kristen Trotz. Thank you, Amy. We're so glad to be here. I'm Kristen Trotz, as Amy mentioned, and I am here with some of my colleagues. Uh, just want to run through our agenda before we dive into the issue. So uh, just by way of background, the Walton Family Foundation is a 30-year-old family foundation based in Bentonville, Arkansas, with offices in D.C., Jersey City, and Denver. Uh, and this was one of our first PAN Foundation projects, something we've lovingly called Hashtag One Foundation. Uh, it's trying to work across our, our four main areas, our K-12 uh, education program, our environment program, our comprehensive quality of life in Northwest Arkansas and the Delta, so we call the home region, as well as working with some of our individually directed uh, partners in trying to understand the, the, how to make measurable our investments in media. And so today we're going to run through what we did, talking a little bit about uh, the project itself, looking to define what success looks like when we invest in media and journalism grants. We're going to highlight what we learned which the, the primary takeaway, if you get nothing else, is that investing on the front end and doing this work up front uh, helps determine what and where to measure. We're going to talk a little bit about what we think it might mean for the field, uh, particularly understanding the capacity of an organization receiving funding to track information that, that helps both the organization learn and uh, to help funders learn. And we'll, we'll flag some possibilities for what's next in terms of standardizing media impact frameworks, indicators, tools, and how we might think about applying this approach beyond media and journalism grants a bit more broadly. So for the next slide, I'll turn it to my colleague, Drew. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for having us uh, present. So to start, one of the things that we needed to focus on, um, or one of the things that we looked at was what was really the issue that we were trying to solve for here? In my role uh, at the foundation, I spend a lot of time with uh, folks like Kristen and Christine who are executing grants to, to help them uh, develop a set of uh, performance measures and goals that really seek to help us understand whether or not our investments are having a meaningful impact on the communities that we serve. And if you kind of step back for a moment and think, uh, depending on where you're working, 
uh, measuring you know your success or the impact that you're having is is you know in some cases really easy and in some cases really hard. So for example, uh, if if we're funding uh, if we're funding a school to open, it's really easy to see um, whether or not we're successful in that endeavor because we can see whether or not the school has opened. Uh, in communications, it's a little bit more difficult. It's a little uh, harder and a little more diffuse to see. You know what was the impact of a particular a particular grant um, that that we had? So we struggled with this for uh, quite a while, and uh, as Kristen mentioned, uh, it, it brought us together kind of across our program areas as well as within a, within our evaluation team to figure out, you know, what do we focus on here? Um, how do we understand if uh, if our investments are having the impact that we that we want them to have? How would we really know if that was happening? And if you think about it, there's really uh, there's really two parts to this, uh, which which my colleagues will talk about here in just a moment. But there's the there's the first part, which is having a clear sense of what you're actually trying to impact or change, so like the front. The front end thinking, the front end planning that goes into to a strategy or to a grant, and then there's the back end work that's really important. So once you've done that upfront planning, and you're really clear on what you're trying to influence or impact. What are the specific measures that you would then need to to really know whether or not you had the impact impact that you intended or not? And so um, we came together and we worked with Lindsey Green Barber. Um, to try to put together uh, a, a set of tools that would really help us understand um, and, and address some of these questions of, you know, uh, how much is enough? Um, how uh, how would we really understand whether we had deep working communications? How how um, do we understand the quality of uh, communications um, stories? And it was something that we really struggled with um, historically, really knowing, you know, what to focus on and having a good understanding of. How much? How much was enough? Um, I'd love to pass it over to Kristen. I know uh, uh, program officers have a, a partic particular, uh, you know, experience with this. I'd love to hear a little bit from her about her experience. Thanks, Drew. I think from the, the program officer side, we had a sense of you know it when you see it, when you know content goes viral. But it became really hard to think about how you measure less than viral, those so sort of more regular, non-explosive stories. So for this project, um, we started by, of course, seeing if anyone had figured this out. We sent emails to listservs. We, we contacted you know, ComNet and folks involved in this work to see if anyone um, had the answers ready to go for us. And, and lo and behold, they, they didn't. Uh, but we did get a tremendous amount of responses uh, of folks saying they were hungry for this work. Um, there were a fair number of organizations who said, you know, no, we haven't figured this out, so we do general support grants you know, for, for our purposes because we're not traditionally a, a media funder and because we're working through these programmatic lenses that didn't work for us. Uh, so we decided to, to take on this work. Uh, and we, we did issue an RFP. We reviewed existing literature. As, as Drew mentioned, that brought us to working with Lindsay Green Barber, who is fantastic. I cannot endorse her enough. Um, and then we looked at what we've done to date. We looked at our existing uh, investments across our K-12 environment and home region uh, work, and we, we decided that focusing on uh, journalism and media-specific investments was a good starting point, uh, as opposed to looking across all of our broader advocacy and communication efforts. But to, to get started and to try to scope this in a way we could uh, relate to, we started with the journalism grant. And so on the next slide, We'll share our findings uh, straight from the source, Lindsay. Great, thanks, Kristen. Um, so just have to say, it's been fabulous working with the Walton Family Foundation and with the team across the programmatic areas and in the strategic learning and evaluation department. Um, and the goal for this work, we really worked to develop a framework that could guide program officers across the foundation's programmatic areas to articulate what their, their potential investments would seek to do for their portfolio work. Um, and then as Kristen said, specifically how to engage in conversations around this work with journalism organizations, which are different than advocacy organizations. So it was you know, strategic decision to, to focus on journalism. And Kristen and Christine can talk a little bit more about those types of conversations later on. 
Um, and then once we've defined what those different goals are, the types of impact that different program officers might be seeking to have, we turn that into a decision tree that would help a program officer look for ways to measure and inform their learning along the way and what types of questions to ask of the grantees or of the journalism organizations as they're identifying those uh, evaluation frameworks together. And so I think one of the big and, takeaways, oh, let's see, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Are you still going? No, nope, done. So one of our big takeaways um, was really that this is upfront work. And so as, as Lindsay shared, understanding where you're going, and this is a, a screenshot from the, the framework that we developed to help you identify the type of audience you're looking for. And doing that work upfront uh, and investing on the front end, co doing that co-creation with your grantee really helps determine what and where to measure. And when you do this in partnership with your grantees, so unfortunately it's not a matter of just handing over a toolkit and having them uh, define it for themselves, but working collaboratively helps you figure out what capacity they have to report uh, on the types of information that you're looking for and making sure that what you're, what you're tracking is meaningful and that they are able to not only uh, track but to analyze the, the things that you have together decide that matter. So Christine, you want to take us through the takeaways? Yep. So there were a lot of takeaways. We thought that these were the ones that um, would be – hold on, let me – go off my headset. So we thought that these were the ones that would be um, the most relevant to the group here. I think that as we kind of navigated this, project and did an inventory of how we were defining terms and the metrics with our grantees, I think it was a really aha moment to see that we were defining and measuring things very differently across, a, you know, from grantee to grantee and from grant to grant. So Lindsay was really helpful with us in helping us identify um, both a glossary of um, terms, but then also resources and tools to measure impact that were easy and not expensive or burdensome for grantees. And so that way we are able to um, use them now, not only across this team, but across our entire foundation. Um, we also spent some time developing outcome indicators that measure what and how much and also sharing those. So, you know, now within the foundation, um, there's standard language and resources and, and terms that are used to, to talk about outcomes and the most important outcomes through a grant. Um, number three, I think, is a little bit about exercises of empathy. So we wanted to really make sure that we were not recommending things to our grantee community and measurement without fully understanding the time and cost it would take. So we would encourage you as you think about how to measure digital outcomes, um, social outcomes, um, reach and circulation of newspapers, and um, how far and wide you want a certain newspaper-like article to go, to do some exercises of empathy to really understand how much time and money it's going to take your grantees. So what that allowed us to do is put forward um, some recommendations for measurement that we feel really confident and don't take too much time, don't take too much expertise, and um, are actually pretty easy for everyone. Um, and then consider ways to amplify. So um, not only is it about creating the content, placing the news article, but it's also about how you get that in front of your audiences. And so we are recommending in our resources, and, and we kind of now have standard language to use as we're talking to grantees about ways to recommend to them that they can put their content and give it extra legs to get it out there further. We know we're not living in a world anymore where people only consume information on one medium, so we want to make sure that we are working in partnership with communications people across you know, our entire community to, to leverage every news hit for all that it's worth. So I will pause there. Great. I want to start with a question um, that's sort of on the communication side, I guess, which is talking about this work. And I think, you know, one thing that comes up is why are charitable dollars being used to support a for-profit media company? 
just in like the barest terms, um, how how is that a good spend yep. in this day and age? So this is Kristen, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, you know, in the context of where I'm working uh, in coastal Louisiana, our sense is that the crisis of land loss is so great and the, um, the process that is unfolding, there's $20 billion coming from the BP oil spill over the next 15 years uh, that affect millions of people that live along the coast and that the need for uh, accurate and, and timely information in order to have an engaged citizenry that can make decisions and participate in that process is so great that we don't have time to wait for the media uh, ecosystem to, to work out its advertising model or its revenue models, and that this is really a, you know, a fourth estate public engagement issue. And so um, we made a, an investment that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail uh, in a few minutes, but we made an investment in the Society of Environmental Journalists to work with the Times Picayune to provide reporting capacity uh, to what, what had been a, a wonderfully robust regional newspaper that has been eviscerated over the years uh, to provide that capacity to be able to report on whether it was you know hurricane season or floods or uh, the ongoing the slow moving disaster of coastal land loss uh, and that that information and access to what's happening where the dollars are going these, these political decisions that were being made uh, is a contribution to the public good. And uh, you know, we also work with partners. We work with the local, we support the local NPR affiliate, Coastal Death. We work with a, a nonprofit investigative news web-based platform. So we're really trying to build the capacity of the local ecosystem to report on and track and follow you know, decisions that are being made over years. The, the recovery from Hurricane Katrina has been you know, 13 years in the making. The oil spill was in 2010. This is long-term work. And having that capacity to be able to report on these issues and keep the public informed over a long period of time is a public good and therefore a, a great use of, of philanthropic resources. And then how do you measure the effectiveness of the journalism? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so there are more stories, there are more column inches, more page views, more of those things, but the effectiveness of the journalism, what are the, how do you do that? Right. So that, that is the, the nature of the question that brought us to, to this work. Um, and this is, this is a starting point. You know, this is what step one of us understanding um, how you do that. So I think we came to this sort of from the negative. I have an example of a grant that I gave around the, the 10th anniversary of Katrina, where uh, this local uh, nonprofit news organization teamed up with ProPublica, had this fantastic response, ended up being quoted in every outlet you can think of, um, you, it truly went viral, but the metric that I had set was around word count, and so it was meant to be a 750-word story. This one ended up being 717 with unbelievable graphics. So by the letter of the law of our evaluation framework, even though it got so much more attention than I could have dreamed possible, it didn't meet the standard I had set ahead of time. And what I learned from that was word count was not a helpful use of uh, attention. Uh, and so we, we had a number of experiences like that, that that brought us to this working group inside the foundation to start to answer that question, how do you measure the effectiveness? And already, Christine and I have two examples to talk through. Uh, in the second half of the webinar, we're learning, you know, it's really about being ready. How do you invest in the capacity and in the people to be ready for success? You don't necessarily know exactly how it's going to show up. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about a, a partnership that happened with the New York Times that exceeded what I thought possible under a grant, but by setting up the systems and by understanding the information that you're looking for that, that gives you that uh, mid-course correction ability, or are you reaching the right audiences? Is this the right vernacular? Is it too technical? Is it, is it accessible enough? Are people engaging with the content? Did it come to the meetings with the decision makers that you care about as a result of participating uh, in this journalism ecosystem? You know, as, as you look all over time and make those adjustments along the way, you're then ready to receive the great opportunities like a 12-page pullout section with the New York Times. All right, I want to get, we're going to go back to questions, but I, I do want to get to, um, to the New York Times piece of it because that is really just, I mean, it's a triumph in every possible way. So let's, let's go to the next slide. So, Christine, I'll let you start it off with, with how it's going so far. 
Yeah, so this is a lot not as sexy as a big, huge Sunday New York Times section, but is, is equally, well, is meaningful as we talk about impact. So for those of you who don't know, Chalkbeat is a nonprofit news outlet and has really become a leader in kind of the impact journalism world um, with the help of Lindsey Green Barber, um, just like we had help from Lindsey Green Barber. Um, and so as we think about impact with Chalkbeat, um, what they have been able to do is create an impact tracker that measures how its journalism is leading to things like law changes and um, public citations by elected officials and or influencers in their community. Um, and given that Chuckbeat was such a best-in-class example of how to do this work, um, we invited them to come alongside us and kind of peek behind the hood as we were developing this project. Um, and I think, you know, as we think about how to make, as communications people think about how to make grants to journalism organizations, there's a lot of questions around how we manage relationships and, and you know, un understand their editorial control. Um, but our experience with Chalkbeat would just make the case that um, when you find those strong partners in the field, letting them in and under the hood um, only makes your final product stronger and frankly can help build trust in the field. So given that we were able to do that with Chalkbeat, um, we submitted a joint presentation to an upcoming conference together um, and have spoken on other panels together. And so um, we're excited that, you know, one of the best grantees of this type of measurement has invited us to come alongside them. Um, Kristen, on to the New York Times. Sure. Uh, so as I mentioned, we, we made a grant to the Society of Environmental Journalists uh, who had done a similar project uh, with another foundation around environmental issues out west. Um, and so they had learned a little bit from that process. And um, we, the, the board chair of FDJ at the time was uh, an environmental reporter at the time, speaking of Mark Schlesstein, um, who had has been in this space for a number of years. And so he, he knew us and our agenda, and we knew him and his approach and, and his you know, integrity. Um, and so recognizing that there, was, there were not enough marks to go around, given how much activity was happening, uh, we worked together to, to set up a, an approach that gave him two uh, younger journalists that he could mentor and at you know, sort of early stage bring them on, have them understand the issue, flesh out the coastal death capacity, and, and serve as a sort of uh, mentorship with Mark Schlafstein, who is at, towards the end of his career. Um, and really one of our, our goals was getting the story of what's happening uh, in coastal Louisiana to a broader audience more regularly. Um, and what we were able to do, because this is a collaborative process with the grantees, you know, th throughout the development of the proposal, we, we were able to have a broader conversation about what it means to get to a broader audience, how we would know, you know, what does it matter? Is it just more eyes on the paper? Or, you know, where is the line between um, what people understanding more and, and you know, how do you measure them taking action when in fact journalism isn't necessarily teed up to view a certain number of policy changes or that sort of thing. Um, so we were able to talk through what we thought would be helpful um, benchmarks along the way, what progress would look like along the way, and in, in large part because of the caliber of the leadership of the Times Picayune, uh, and because it is Louisiana and all things are related, and Dean Ake's brother is, is on staff at the Times Picayune, um, they were able to develop a partnership that came, you know, from Dean Ake uh, acknowledging the role in national that national outlets need to play in supporting the expertise of local journalism. Uh, and they were able to develop this partnership that, that culminated in a 12-page special section that ran concurrently in both papers about a month ago. Um, additionally, you know, they are developing real-time live stream content that augments their written reporting, so this behind the news aspect, and we've been able to track engagement across multiple platforms. So they've done Facebook Live, they've done uh, Ask Me Anything on Twitter, they've done uh, in-person panels, uh, and we're able to get a sense of you know what? What can what works to continue the conversation in addition to the you know obviously thrilling splash of, of the paper itself and the, the pictures above the fold on A1. Um, you know what does it mean to engage over time and not just not just the, the one and done uh, special issue, but but how do you how do you understand engagement and how do you ratchet it up over time? 
Um, and so this has been a, a helpful starting point for us both understanding the information we have as well as identifying what we will need to know in the future in terms of what a sustained engagement look like and how do you know if people take action as a result of that. Right. That's actually in, in the questions that we're getting, that's, um, that's a theme that keeps coming up. So grants are obviously a finite period of time, three years, whatever it is. How do you, do you add time onto that to allow the impact to be revealed? Right. Is there, you know, how long is the tail right. on, on this work? And, you know, I will definitely have Drew, our evaluation expert, uh, speak more to that. But from my standpoint, you know, we have, we do grant level metrics, we do initiative level metrics, we do strategy level metrics. And so it's about finding what you're testing for over time. Uh, in my case, I have a particular um, effort to, to understand what needs to move the needle on conversation around coastal restoration during our five-year strategy. And so I'm not necessarily holding individual grants responsible for that outcome because that, that's outsized for the scale and timeline of the grant, as you were saying, Amy. But understanding how the portfolio of investments works together and how you can measure you know, change in attitudes, and, and, and as the, the toolkit that, that we're going to share shows, you know, there's various survey mechanisms you can use, there's various media analytics you can look at. You know, all of these are pieces of the puzzle. There is no silver bullet one thing that you do to measure all of these things and answer all of these questions, but it helps you look across your portfolio of investments, understand what you're measuring at the grant level, what you're measure, measuring at the strategy level. Do you have the right players? Do you have the right voices? Are you, are you making progress towards the change that you're seeking? So, the, the work that we did here helps, and, and this will be uh, available, we'll share it out. It helps you walk through those questions that you ask on the front end, which is what I mean by this is upfront work. Knowing that a, a journalism fund, a uh, grant for journalism oriented at, you know, local, you know, in this case, New Orleans residents, you know, that's going to give me a, a smaller scope of outlets or of uh, people that could participate in the survey if that was the method I was using to understand, you know, the change in awareness or change in attitude. Or change in behavior. Or change I mean, how do, you, exactly. how do you tie this back to behavior change? Right. And is that, I mean, the ultimate impact is behavior change. Right, which, of course, we have to stay within the 501c3 requirements of, you know, we're not going right. to, you know, task a grantee with changing, you know, achieving a certain percentage in an election. That, that would not fly. <laughs> so, you know, what are those proxies that you can look to that, that help inform this changing you know, landscape or, or information without you know, crossing all the way over into getting into electoral politics. Um, but you know, what, what other tools are out there to, to measure that change over time? And helping think through the, the timeline to your question of, of these grants. These grants for us have started to become longer in part because there's a lot of setup time. And so the, the grant to the Society for Environmental Journalists, which supports the Times Picayune, is a three-year grant, which is longer than most of my other grants in my portfolio, in part because we spent a year setting up baselines and understanding you know, where are things currently and what, how many Facebook fans do you have currently and how many readers interact, you know, how many subscribers interact with your content online at, at a given time period. Um, so there is a lot of upfront work to setting this up, but as a result, we're able to you know, understand that you know, Facebook Live is a great platform for this conversation and to spend more resources investing in that kind of programming as opposed to something else that might not work as well. How does it differ from other grantees, the setup time, the evaluation? I mean, I, I think of journalists in a way that is, you know, and I, I say this with affection, but um, sort of more prickly yeah. than the average earnest do-gooder might be. I think it depends on where you work. Some, some of us have a lot of prickly. Yeah. Well, but, well, Christine, do you want to take that, you know, talking about your um, experience with communicators in particular? Yeah, I mean, and, and just to clarify, the question is about how does how do how are these grants how do we have to approach these grants differently, right? Given that they're media outlets, right? right. Yeah. Um, sorry, I thought I hung up. Um, the answer is is pretty differently, right? There are clear boundaries of editorial control, and if you are making grants to news organizations to try to influence their reporting, honestly, 
pay for sponsored content because it's a much easier way to do that. So I think you really have to change the foundation on which you approach grant making given that you have to recognize that grants are not about influencing coverage. They are about educating the public and increasing awareness of issues even if at times those issues are not covered in the way that is frankly, as a communications person, I would pitch them or um, hope that working with a reporter would kind of lead to. Um, and, you know, building relationships with people like um, Elizabeth Green at Chalk, who's our executive editor, or um, Sean Kavanaugh at Education Week, who is their sponsorship manor, manager, is just different from building relationships with reporters, and it doesn't supplement me having to take reporters up, you know, meet reporters for coffee and build relationships separately. Um, so I would say that, you know, really understanding um, what you are able, your limits as a grant maker um, before approaching the conversation and then not giving up on continuing to build relationships with reporters as you would do anyway because they're just totally separate. Awesome. So we have we have two more slides. I know there are lots of questions, uh, but we'll run through these quickly and then um, turn it back over and have a, a lively discussion, I'm sure. Um, so in terms of what's next, obviously this is a starting point. You know, for those of you looking for the Rosetta Stone on how to track all things uh, journalism and media, I'm sorry if this isn't it, but it is a, a starting point that we look forward to sharing. Uh, we'll we'll have a public-facing document um, that we'll share through the ComNet newsletter uh, in the coming days, but. It, it, Specifically, you know, where we felt yeah. we left off at the end of this project is that there's room for more learning. So this is a, a very dynamic media landscape. You know, in the social realm, as Christine talked about earlier, you know, algorithms are changing all the time. How you think about, um, you know, what what is accessible and, and what make what definitions make sense. This is this is not a static situation. It's certainly something we we'll have to continue to, to track and evaluate. Uh, going forward, but in terms of the, the field more broadly, um, one of the, the pieces of feedback we got from a grantee was that um, they had a couple of funders who were interested in media impact but all used different approaches. And so one thought for the funders among us is, you know, are, are there possibilities to, to standardize our framework? Could we use similar definitions or similar tools? Are there indicators that that could serve to, to form a common language and, and work for multiple funders so that we're um, investing in the capacity of an organization to track, but also uh, not asking them to track everything under the sun. In that same vein, you know, I talked about the, the six months to a year we spent setting up uh, baseline data. There may be opportunities to share some of that load and to, to share baseline data collection across uh, different interest groups or, or sectors. Um, to think about identifying goals, um, understanding where you are is one of the most important things to then setting a, a target, particularly if you're looking for quantifiable uh, improvements or quantifiable outcomes. You need to know where you are so you can understand what, what percent change you're looking for and is, is that meaningful. Um, and I know Lindsay's going to talk about that a little bit uh, in a moment. Um, I can't underscore this enough, the, the importance of collaboration with good people. And that trust of, um, as Christine said, you know, this is this is different from lots of other kinds of grant making where you, you have a very almost widgetized, you know, I am looking for this many policy papers or this many signatures or this many people attend an event. Um, it, this is not that kind of grant making, and so having those relationships and being two-way streets uh, and being able to collaborate with good people and being ready for a, a success and trusting that they have the resources to take advantage uh, when opportunity comes knocking uh, or to let you know if they need more. Uh, but that the collaboration with good people is really critical. And I think we've, we wrapped this project internally feeling like um, we needed to road test it and really apply it to more of our grants before we could come back and, and take a second crack. But we also felt that there was a lot here that we, for logistical reasons, had kept focused on the uh, media and journalism space that we might think about uh, expanding more broadly for you know, advocacy or policy communication. So you know, do our grantees understand how effective their newsletters are and their um, push materials that they're sending out to their various stakeholder groups? 
are there ways to think about um, coming up with similar language and, and sort of impact frameworks that might be applied outside journalism and to other uh, sectors like, like advocacy and policy. So Christine, yeah. I'm going to turn it to you to, to take us up uh, through the summary wrap up and then we're going to dive into more questions. Yep. Um, so thank you for that, Kristen. Um, a lot of this I think has been covered already, so I'll just go quickly. Um, do the work up front. Drew talked about that. Um, this framework allows us to ask some questions early on that have really clarified process and led to a quicker um, and more effective grant, you know, new grant and or grant renewal process. Um, understand the grantee's capacity to track, analyze, and report on information specifically related to time and cost. Um, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, the dynamic media landscape means things aren't standing still and you may need to adjust. So for example, even in the um, you know, toolkit that we have created, it's only a couple months old now. Things with Facebook have obviously evolved and measurement tools are constantly changing. And so we recognize that um, we have to be flexible where appropriate and do our best to standardize definitions um, with our grantees on the front end to make sure that we're setting each other up for success. Partnership with other funders is something we're really looking forward to. Um, and you know, these types of resources that hopefully, you know, we'll get over to you guys next week in the newsletter go beyond uh, just journalism and communications grants. So as a communications person, I have incorporated them into my communications plan and goal setting with my boss. We've been able to kind of raise the bar about how we measure media placements um, and the fact that not all media placements are created equal, which sometimes goes in my favor and sometimes does not, as you can imagine. Um, so, you know, I have found that these tools are effective in working with program officers who manage work and not communications grants because ultimately communications is a strategy that's helping our grantees advance their work and reach their goals at a quicker pace. Um, so it's our hope that when you all see these, you're going to find opportunities to use them, not just related to communications and media grants, but, but for all elements of your work. So I just want to get, thank you for that. Um, I, I want to get to some of the questions that, that have been coming in. Um, I'm going to start with, how many things do you have to measure? How, you know, what's too many, what's not enough, what are, and does that vary by grant and goal? But what's a good sort of basic premise for that? Drew and Lindsay, I'm going to kick that to you guys. Sure. I can, I can just take a, a first stab at that and give kind of an unsatisfying answer, which is uh, it depends. I mean, I think for us, we often think about that in terms of, you know, the duration of the grant, the overall spend of the grant, and, you know, long, obviously longer, more expensive um, investments are usually, uh, usually you know, the, the case because you're doing deeper work or longer term work where you might want to have a few more, uh, a few more performance measures. I think that one of the things that we learned through this process and, and the toolkit that uh, was developed is, it helps us with this is it's really, you know, it, it's, better to, it's better to begin the process thinking about who you're trying to reach and what you're trying to accomplish rather than trying to hit like we need eight measures here, or we need six measures, or we need 12 measures. It's really more about upfront kind of working through a process where you're doing the planning and thinking um, first and then thinking about, okay, given, given you know, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish, who we're trying to uh, influence here, what's, what's the appropriate measurement um, strategy that kind of sits beside that. Lindsay, what would you add? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Drew. And I would just say that when thinking about it on the front end, the most important thing to me that really is the parameters for what your KPIs or your measurement methods are going to be are really what are the goals and whether that's for a particular uh, investment, if it's for one piece of content, whether it's for a communication strategy. I, that's always to me the most important thing to start with. And then from that, you can start to get more specific and kind of prioritize within those goals what do you care most about. And then let that lead you to the appropriate indicators and or methods. And I think one of the things you'll see when the the, um, the toolkit and the guide are made available uh, to you all is that the, the 
difference in the way that the Walton Family Foundation is thinking about evaluation is that it takes the kind of traditional media metrics, you know, web analytics, all these um, engagement metrics that you can use, provides definitions for them, but really provides a framework where you can pare down to just what are the core indicators that really matter given a particular set of goals, and then complements that with different types of qualitative ways to get at some of that more kind of fuzzy, difficult to get at offline, what's really happening in terms of people's level of knowledge, awareness, behavior change, um, or if you think about structural or institutional changes like policy change, that of course takes time, um, but gives some different ways that you can actually bring that type of research or evaluation into what traditionally has been uh, pretty focused on uh, analytics and reach numbers, frankly. And so thinking about how can you help provide capacity to an organization to be able to do an audience survey over time so that you can really start to understand who is that audience, what do they know, how are they accessing information, are they trusting that information, which is of course a, a key question at this particular moment in time. Um, or how do you do something like content analysis and not just on media reach, but if you're interested in uh, uh, affecting policy, for example, how can you actually look at how media coverage is influencing how policy is being discussed in different chambers of Congress or whatever it is. And so it provides these different kind of methods and analytics and, and hopefully walks you through a process where you arrive at those that are most important. Um, so I agree with Drew, it's not that there's a particular number, you know, eight or something, um, but you're going to end up with a handful of indicators that you can gather in the short term that are pretty accessible to an organization and shouldn't be particularly onerous to gather, um, and then potentially have some other more kind of advanced or more resource intensive methods for getting at the tougher questions that again, if it's a big enough priority you can do, and maybe you don't have to do every time, but if you do it with a handful of organizations over time, you can start to feel more confident in that strategy or, or have better advice even to share with others how they might be tweaking their strategies to achieve their goals. Can you talk a little bit about how the evaluation portion of the work is influencing how you move forward with sourcing grants and managing grants and measuring them? Sure. So, Drew, I'll let you give the SLED perspective and then I'm happy to chime in from the program officer perspective. Yeah, I'll just offer a couple of, a couple of quick thoughts. I think it's really important um, for us as a foundation. We're really focused on learning, and we're really we're really trying to think about, um, you know, how can you how can you design um, as as Lindsay and I were talking about just a second ago, a really focused set of measures that will help you understand in a year, two years, three years, um, what have been successes and what have been point, you know kind of pain points and for us, you know, I think um, Kristen and Christine can probably speak to this a little bit more, but for us, those, those, the measures really do inform the next grant cycle. You know, I, I think program officers are taking a look at, a well, you know, if the measures are well designed. You know, if, if, if they're focused on word count, maybe less so, but if, if we really worked this process, we've been thoughtful, and we have a really kind of clean, well thought, thought out set of measures, what we get back from grantees really helps us uh, helps us and them learn together and think about, okay, so in the next grant cycle, like what are the kinds of things we should continue to focus on and go deeper on? What are the things that maybe we, we do less of? Um, are we starting to see some um, early results of our work? You know, are, are, we, are we moving towards the kinds of outcomes that we were hoping to see or, or not? You know, and it, it's an important opportunity to kind of take stock, take stock learn, and readjust. From the program officer perspective, um, I think the uh, idea of having a portfolio approach is uh, important. So, as Drew was saying, you know, we're learning, we're learning over time. We're learning to inform the next uh, grant cycle. But ideally, if, you, if you're doing it right, your evaluation approach is helping you understand if you have the right tools in your toolbox across the, the board. Uh, to make the change that you're working for. So, so in my case, you know, it's making sure that we have the right blend of voices and sources and, and sort of um, depth of reporting on, on the coastal restoration, coastal land loss issues. So we did some investments uh, with the, the NPR affiliate, WWNO, 
in New Orleans uh, who did a, a way more beginner's sort of coastal glossary 101 series where they took down terms like subsidence or sediment and, and did a, a deeper dive accessible um, you know, interviews with experts and sort of gave the technical definition and then gave layman's terms definitions and, and featured a couple of terms a week every week for six months. Um, and that, that sort of helped lay the groundwork. You know, then we saw that there were, was a need for uh, longer form, more investigative pieces about where the money is going or um, you know, a more technical look at, you know, there was a, a long piece on Army Corps permitting issues. And it's you know the evaluation metric, both at the individual grant level and then broader across the portfolio, help you understand if you have the right mix of those investments at the right places, so that you're moving the ball forward. Uh, and if if you have skip steps or if there's a hole, you know how to fill it, what kind of voice is needed, what kind of investment is needed to, to round that out, so that you're continuing to move forward. Um, you know I think for the post restoration work. Our journalism grants, and I think the theme would be the same for, for K-12, uh, our journalism grants are means to an end. They're up there. That, that's why we constantly qualify that we, we don't identify as a traditional media funder, um, that we, we are in service of our programmatic goals and our strategies. Um, and so they're part of an overall portfolio. And so these, these three journalism grants I've referenced in New Orleans are you know, three among 50. Um, where we're working with, with advocacy groups, we're working with community groups, we're funding science, we're funding uh, other you know, policy advocacy efforts. Um, but that the theory of change is that because we are looking to uh, ensure that the, the restoration dollars spent over time, the settlement is 15 years, is that that's going to take political will to make sure that it's done right. And it's, to get political will, you need support over a long period of time. And people need to think this issue is important, they need to understand how it's happening, and they need to know how to engage in the process over time. And so journalism is one way that we are looking to, to achieve that sort of sustained engagement in a really technical, complicated, slow-moving disaster issue. And so by making these grants in our larger portfolio, you know, we, are, we are hoping that we are keeping that drumbeat of coverage and information and that there are credible voices helping people get a handle on this pretty complicated, wonky issue over a sustained period of time. So we look for evaluation measures that are helping us test that at the individual grant level, at the portfolio level, and, and understanding the evolution of an issue over time. Um, speaking of just the dollar amount, one question is, can you share the dollar amount of yeah. the grant to the Society for Environmental Journalism? So it is not intentionally opaque on our website. We are improving our uh, the way that we code our grants to make this more user-friendly, uh, but all of our grant information is available on our website in our annual report. And the grant for SEJ, uh, we were about 18 months in, and it was a um, it was about 130,000 a year for three years, so just under 400,000 uh, dollar grant for three years. And we made that in uh, late 2016. Another question um, is, can you share the language that's used with the grantees' contract and scope of work that includes measurement and, and tracking of influence? I mean, I know that you have, you know, and, and we'll be sharing it in the next comment newsletter, um, some of the public-facing materials that support all of this. But in terms of the specifics of when you enter into this kind of relationship with a journalism grantee. What does that scope of work look like? So I, I will take a stab at a general answer. Um, I, I think it's not going to be surprising. It, it largely depends. So it depends on the, the scope of the investment. It depends on the, the scope of the work, the pristine scope, uh, with a lot of K-12 investments are more national in nature. Mine tend to be local because I'm working in a specific place. So, um, you know, obviously we have our standard, you know, grant contracts that, that govern, you know, all of our compliance issues and all that. The metrics portion is part of our application development, um, and it literally answers the questions, who is doing what, by when, how will we know, um, and, and, and how much. Um, so we're, that's where we're, we do our collaborative uh, work with the grantees up front before it's even gone to proposal review for our grant committee. We're trying to understand 
that, that who is doing what and how much question. You know, how many articles, how long are the articles, where you, you pitch articles to, you pitch local articles to a national outlet, which, which ones, which ones matter. Um, so again, doing this upfront work, trying to figure out, you know, what is it you're trying to influence, what are the pathways to that, that influence, and what are some, um, some indicators that might, might show you progress towards that, uh, which Lindsay has mapped out really well in the, in the paper we'll be sharing with the group. Um, that helps determine the metrics. So there aren't any set sort of general metrics. They're all hyper-specific to the investment and to the group. Um, Drew, you could share whether we have sort of more, more general uh, evaluation resources uh, to this, but we, we don't have anything, um, to my knowledge, that is sort of generic that would speak to this that, that we're able to share. Most of it's part of our grant contract, which is not public. Drew, That's do you know correct. if we have anything I'll else? I'll put in the chat window a link to our, our general strategy learning and evaluation page, which does contain, contain a little bit of what Kristen just talked about in case folks are interested. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and, and uh, Lindsay, can uh, you speak to oh, – I'm sorry. Lindsay, no, can, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, if you can speak to, um, to the report or the white paper that's been – that's been developed in conjunction with, with this work and with measuring media impact. So that we'll be sending out a link in our next newsletter, but if you can give, if you can give folks a preview of, of what that's about. Sure. So um, I'll, I'll let Christine or Kristen or Drew jump in, but just to give a super high level, there are going to be essentially two pieces of um, or two resources that will be coming everyone's way. One is kind of an overview of just, you know, what is journalism as a field and how is funding journalism or working with journalists slightly different than working with other types of organizations. Um, and just to circle back to the last question, just an observation kind of from the field, I would say that often uh, foundations that are funding journalistic work is part of broader programmatic or portfolio areas and not just, you know, kind of, um, general support for journalism writ large, tend to have the exact same grant agreements that they have with all of their other types of grantees. So the same types of reporting materials, the same uh, types of um, documentation that's required. So it, it seems to be pretty standard. It's just the specific indicators that are going in there might be a little bit different. Um, and then the second piece of content will be the actual toolkit that will walk uh, people through what the process is internally at the Walton Family Foundation and give some examples for how to set goals at the outset and then think about what different target audiences are depending upon what type of impact you're hoping to have um, and then gets you to what types of indicators and or complementary research methods would you use to really be able to understand what success looks like um, and also to identify what additional resources an organization might need in order to uh, meet those needs um, and uh, Again, so hopefully this can be an exercise in not only uh, working with journalists to get them to be doing this work, but also to be helping to think about, especially with newer nonprofit or digital startups, how can this be a process that helps actually build their internal capacity for thinking about their work strategically and understanding their success. Do you, are there differences in the way that you measure impact when it's sponsored content versus earned media? or do the rules apply across the board? Lindsay, I'm going to kick that to you. Yeah, I mean, I think that you can use these same indicators and or research methods for any type of communication. So as uh, Christine and Kristen were saying, you can use this to think about advocacy work. Um, you can use it to think about sponsored content or, or you know, PSAs. These research methods and indicators are the same across the field of communication. I think what becomes quite different, however, is the way that you're structuring the conversation for the grantees and also the type of impact that you're intending that they might have. Um, and I think, for example, if you're thinking about sponsored content, you're typically thinking about its effect on an individual. Whereas if you're funding a journalistic project writ large, um, take uh, Kristen's work that is happening in the Gulf, there certainly there's a goal to increase kind of awareness there, but that's closely tied to other types of capacity building work that's happening with um, local government, for example, and so the types of impacts you're looking for might be different. But I think the indicators and methods can be the same um, across different types of content. 
And this is Christine from a communications like in my personal experience, I would say 100%, totally the same um, and helpful in all scenarios. If you fund, uh, let's say, a print publication, how do you guarantee that your grant dollars are going to fund those efforts? Or, you know, do, does the grant cover a staff member, or is it more? I mean, can you speak to the specifics of that? How you know yep. that you're getting what you're paying for, or what you're paying for? Christine, do you have any examples you want to pull from? I mean, I would say like. It's, you know, it's funny, in some grants, right, a lot of the grants in my experience in media outlets are general operating grants, whereas with other grants, they go to support specific program areas, and that's because as long as the quantity and quality of reporting is coming in at the level that we mutually agree upon is fair, then, you know, resources, they, you know, it should be up to them. So, um you know, I would I would argue that the type of tracking that's required from journalism outlets is fairly rigorous, given we're talking about page views and links to each article, and sometimes even links to tweets. Um, but we do try to be super fair and empathetic as to capacity on their end. But um, you know, every article comes with a link to that article, so we can see it online. So um, a lot of pretty rigorous tracking, I would say. Kristen, I don't know if you have anything to add there. Yeah, in my case, um, you know, I, I find uh, a radio station that, that puts copy of their stories on their website, a web-based uh, outlet, and then the, the work with the Times Picayune. Um, we do fund salaries. Um, and, and again, to my point of working with good people, I think, you know, that's the critical trust point. Uh, so we have pretty robust uh, financial reporting requirements. You know, we, we show ahead of time, you know, where dollars are going to be spent uh, in terms of, you know, salary, benefits, overhead, travel, you know, and, and try to establish an upfront um, open lines of communication that if things need to change. So we had a, a major staffing change at one of the, one of the grantees uh, that resulted in, you know, no salary costs, but they had to hire a freelancer to, to bridge an, a, a gap in staffing. Uh, so we work with them to make those changes, but we do, you know, we, we amend the budget and then they have to report on that going forward. So uh, I think if you are clear on what your goals are, you're clear on what you are getting out of the event, you're clear on the charitable purpose, um, there's usually a way to, to get comfortable that the dollars are going to that in service of that work. Thank you so much. Um, we're getting to the top of the hour and unfortunately there are a bunch of questions we haven't answered. But we will, um, in our next newsletter, we'll have links to, to all of the materials that we've discussed and the slide that is on your screen right now has contact information for Lindsay and Drew and Kristen and Christine, who I'm sure would love to hear from you. And I just want to say thank you to everybody for, for dialing into this and to our presenters and to my colleague Tristan who makes the magic happen. And with that, thank you very much. We will see you next time.